So welcome to our fourth PD session here. We're going to save the soup today with an ocean engineering challenge. My name is Emily Nicholson. I'm one of the coordinators here at pre-college programs um, up at OSU. And today we are going to be focusing, like I said, on engineering design. Um, a few agreements before we get going. Um, virtual world presents new challenges. I'm sure everyone is dealing with them. Um, so a few agreements that we'd like to keep. Uh, the chat is definitely open for questions, comments, concerns, um, but all communication needs to be respectful, which um, we expect, we expected nothing less. Um, keep your microphone muted outside of breakout rooms if you could. This morning we have a relatively small um, gathering, so we probably won't be doing breakout rooms, but just keeping your microphone muted would be appreciated. We can hear some keyboards typing. Um, so that's one of the reasons for that. Um, patient and understanding uh, with regards to others' experience with technology. Some people are a little more advanced than others. Um, and we acknowledge you're likely working from home. So if you have cats or dogs or children in the background, um, don't worry about that. We, we fully acknowledge that. Um, one note, anyone who violates will be removed from Zoom. But um, like I said, not, not really worried about that. Uh, agreements in the breakouts or during the activity. Um, we will not be doing breakouts today, um, but the last two are still relevant. Uh, share without expectations. So we know that each and every one of you has a different situation going on right now um, and different students, resources and that sort of thing. So what works for you might not work for other organizations, but trying to listen um, to these stories and pick up the lessons um, and not necessarily the stories themselves. So a quick outline of today, um, we're gonna go through a couple lesson acknowledgements where the lesson came from, talk about objectives, connect it to the Oregon's distance learning for all, um, and then do the first part of the lesson and then Jay Well, who is the Associate Director of the SMILE program is gonna run us through um, the activity itself. Talk about a couple extensions, quick note about the PDU certificates, um, and then some Q&A at the end. If you have questions as we go, feel free to um, either write them in the chat um, or there's a raise hand feature and we're happy to answer those as we go too. So the activity itself came from powered by IEE engineering, um, their Tri engineering series, and that was slightly adapted by the RCRV um, project at OSU, which Adam is a part of, and he'll talk about in a little bit. All right, so the Regional Class Research Special Project at Oregon State University, um, we're funded by NSF, and we're kind of leading the construction on three research vessels. Um, so you know, it's kind of vessel time the way that scientists book telescope time. So to fund them and facilitate that and OSU is leading a construction of a new vessel. Can we go to the next slide? And so um, if you want to end at the bottom left there, you'll see um, kind of our uh, CEO's page at the College of Earth, Ocean, Atmosphere Sciences at Oregon State. Um, we should have all three vessels completed by 2023. Um, the three vessels, the first one's RV Tawny. Um, that one's going to be operated by Oregon State University. Tawny uh, means offshore in the native Salish language. The other one is the RV Resolution, operated by University of Rhode Island. And then there's kind of a universities off the Gulf Coast, with the institution being University of Southern Mississippi. And theirs is named the Arbert Mason after um, um, Gilbert Mason, you see right there, the doctor in the local area that led desegregation efforts to the uh, local waterways, uh, also an American swimmer, so kind of a representation of a local icon there. Um, later on in this, you'll see how your students, if they use social media, can connect with the RCRV project uh, through Facebook and Instagram. A main goal of NSF is to promote the connection between, you know, the folks doing the science to the general crowd who is. So you'll see an extension later on of how your students may want to um, do this activity with their family and create a, and tag RCRV in it. And then we could share that with NSF um, and just gives them some, some, you know, some sort of interaction right now. So, all right. Excellent, thanks Adam. Um, so the objectives of the workshop today is for you to gain an understanding of the lesson itself and review some of the resources available for you to teach the lesson at distance. Uh, the objectives of the lesson itself is for the students to learn a little bit uh, about the personal flotation devices or PFDs 
engage in engineering of a PFD um, to meet specific criteria and then through that experience the engineering design process. But we also want to point out the currently right now we need to worry about the social and emotional um, learning as well. So it's a relatively low resource um, lesson. So it's reasonably accessible to most students. It is fun and it helps build and maintain the relationships um, both within the family and then with their peers and friends as well. But also equally as important um, is your social emotional um, environment and, and learning as well. So the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning or CASEL um, list four core focus areas during this pandemic. Um, number three is the social emotional learning of young people, but even more important is attending to the well being and mutual support um, among adults. So, keeping a close attention on your own social emotional needs in order to be the community of adults, um, adults to best serve the young people. So, with that in mind, um, with this workshop, we're gonna try and foster that supportive adult relationships to process emotions, share challenges, and offer support. So we encourage you to share your challenges um, with activities or teaching um, and kind of work out different options um, to help go about solving those. Connecting to Oregon Distance Learning for All, uh, this would be a teacher-led instruction um, it would be an opportunity for interdisciplinary, well-rounded learning. It is aligned to the K-12 standards, the Next Generation Science Standards, and it focuses on engineering as well. Um, and then outside of that, the students are able to conduct independent research, innovate with their families, draw, craft, um, evaluate, explain, and create solutions to, to problems. So the activity itself, this PowerPoint will be online as it is, so you're able to see the resources, but then we also have a lesson PowerPoint that just takes out these slides. So if you want to share it with your students, um, it's a little bit easier for you. So first we're going to go through a little bit of the history of PFDs. So they started out as hollowed sealed gourds um, back in ancient times. But my question that I would like you to think about and reply in chat is what decade was the life vest invented and what was it made out of? Like a like a synthetic one or? So the first, so it was sealed gourds to begin with. And then what was the first life vest as we kind of think? What was the decade and what was it made out of? 1910s, 1960s? rubber, cotton, cork. Emma hit the nail on the head with that one. It was cork, but it was much earlier than everyone else was thinking. Um, 1800, Emma, you are closest, I'd split. So about 18, 1850s um, is when the first life vest that we kind of think of as a life vest was invented. Um, and since then, it moved to watertight cells with KPOC, which is kind of a vegetable material. Um, then it moved into foam, and then we're not sure where it can go from here. So every year, the U.S. Boat Association Innovation or the U.S. Boat Association um, hosts an innovation in life jacket design competition. Um, and recently, this is the the winner. Um, this is what's called a CT, and it's like a regular shirt. Um, but there's air chambers inside. So if you fall in, you can pull a tab and it kind of fills it up. With this, they're trying to get at, this is something everyone should wear and not necessarily something that you have to think about putting on. This is in a shirt that you're gonna be wearing anyway. Um, so with that, uh, we're gonna kind of be thinking about that innovation. Um, where's the next kind of life jacket that we're looking at? So in order to be a PFD, um, it needs to be easily accessible an appropriate size and the U.S. Coast Guard approved. And we're gonna keep these in mind as we're developing our PFD today. Um, thinking about the different types of personal flotation devices, when can you think that people use PFDs and who would be using them? So if you wanna reply in chat, when are all of the times you think that people use personal flotation devices? Excellent, I'm seeing on boats, swimming, boating, kids especially, yeah, I think a lot of times we think of life jackets, um, but other PFDs could include when little kids have those little floaties on their arms. Um, those are personal flotation devices. They're just not of life vest. 
and more of a floaty. Um, Non-swimmers definitely, um, and swimmers too, um, depending on how difficult the water is to, to swim through. So um, the Coast Guard has five different types of PFDs. They have offshore, nearshore, flotation aids, throwable devices, um, and special use devices. Um, so we don't go into what exactly each of these types um, is made out of, um, but students are able to kind of search into those, look into those research, um, and maybe look around their house to see what type of flotation devices they have, like a pool noodle, um, kind of what that might be. So our design challenge today, um, our requirements, again, are as it needs to be easily accessible, appropriate in size, um, and Coast Guard approved. So we're going to say that everything we create today is Coast Guard approved um, for our can of soup, uh, because we're not going to get it approved. Um, but we need it to be easily accessible and an and appropriate size. So who are we saving today? Um, you should have some sort of can, whether it be soup or vegetables. Um, if everyone kind of has it next to you, wants to hold up your can of soup. Oh, Adam has a um, soda can, excellent, yes. Mushroom soup, Joel has a can of mushroom soup, excellent. Um, I had, this is Stalbush Farms pumpkin, um, which is what I decided to do today. Um, and then our design criteria today is gonna be, your PFD needs to be a single piece. So if you're thinking about it and you have to put on a life jacket, you don't want three different pieces that you're putting on together. Um, it will need to be easily accessible. Um, so that's that one piece, an appropriate size, um, and it needs to be attached within 20 seconds. So this is, if you're thinking it needs to be quick, single piece, and some part of the can must touch the water. So it can't be a boat that the can sits in. It needs to be a life jacket that helps it float. So with this, we're gonna be doing the engineering design process. Um, so it should be somewhat familiar to you, but first we're gonna ask, what are the problems? What are we trying to solve? We're gonna brainstorm ideas, pick the one we like the most, draw a diagram, figure out what materials we need, gather those materials, create it, um, and then test it out. And then that full circle is improving it again. So with our current PFD, what are the problems? How can we fix it? So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jay, um, who's going to lead us through the activity. So now the fun, the fun begins. Um, hopefully you'll have been able to collect some supplies since we are going to get into actually um, doing this activity. And so you can see here, we're at the first part of the engineering design process, this ask. And really the ask is, you know, trying to figure out what the problems are, what sort of constraints there are. And we have um, put some of those in there as it needs to be a one, uh, a single piece uh, attached within 20 seconds, you're gonna get some points. You can see there, um, that's how we're going to score this. So if you can attach it within 20 seconds, you're gonna get 30 points um, because you wanna get these things on quickly. And then some part of the can must um, touch the water. And ideally with a um, personal flotation device, you do that so a person's head would stay above the water instead of um, their head below the water and their feet sticking straight out. Um, so um, that is the first process we're going to do. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now is the time for you to brainstorm. You may have already gotten out some materials, but start thinking about what types of material that you have available, your students have available around the house that you could use to make a personal flotation device. That may be thinking about um, personal flotation devices you've used. It may be thinking about things that float um, and things that don't float. Um, but be thinking about those and we're gonna give you about 20 seconds and then we're gonna do some sharing out in the chat with what you came up with. So once you figure out some materials you're gonna use or that you think your students might be able to use, please share them out in the chat. Okay, anybody come up with some materials to use for their, I like it, juice boxes. So here we're using some, some things with airspace and I also like the 
uh, juice boxes can be sort of repurposed. Um, cans, uh, maybe like a, a lightweight can or a bottle, plastic bag with air. So a lot of things looking at density, um, things that are going to float well. Now the big challenge is how you're going to attach um, those items to your can because this is one of the hard parts and I think one of the the problems with uh, personal flotation devices and why people don't use them, and we kind of saw this in the innovation challenge, is you want a, a personal flotation device that isn't big and bulky, so it doesn't like um, constrain your movement, but is always on you um, for when you need it, because you never know when you're gonna need it. So let's go to the next step, which is plan. And this is always, I think, a, a difficult um, one for students to do the, you know, we all just want to take those materials, the brainstorm and jump right in and start building and um, testing. But I think that going through the planning stage um, can be really helpful because this is the way engineering works. Uh, a lot of times um, building and testing is expensive. And so engineers go through a lot of planning to make sure what they are going to build and test is most likely going to work and meet the criteria that's been laid out for the project. So take this opportunity, you have, um, you have one minute to uh, start diagramming what your personal flotation device for your can is going to look like. And if you finish early, um, don't be afraid to sort of leave and gather some supplies. We're gonna have, we're gonna spend about four minutes um, on this stage. So just a reminder, as you finish your um, about a minute of diagramming, a quick diagram, um, gather your supplies that are around you because the next step is where the rubber hits the road. We're going to start creating. So we have about two minutes left here. Um, I suggest that if you haven't started getting some supplies um, do so. And as you're getting supplies, you know, be thinking about if you were to do this with your students, um, either uh, and, and your students were going through this, um, what sorts of things might they be getting? What sorts of um, limitations might they be experiencing as they're collecting these supplies and, and getting ready to do this? I think anticipating um, students' needs, as you know, is really important to making sure that as students are doing this, um, either by themselves or with the assistance of a uh, parent or guardian, it's um, important to, to make sure they're thinking about um, all those little roadblocks that they might come into so they will be successful in the end, especially as they get to the fun part. So about 40 seconds left, and then we're going to the create. Um, and the create part is going to be, um, Going to be timed so uh, we're going you're gonna have five minutes to put everything together and um, hopefully you haven't started putting things together yet and then once um, that's up and we're all ready we'll get to the testing part all right all right we're going to move to the test now so hopefully you have all your materials it's time it's time to build um, and my timer's going up um, so you're gonna have five minutes for this stage Couple things I want to remind you of of those of those criteria: single piece, attach quickly within 20 seconds to get those 30 points, um, and some part of the can must touch the water. So we're not putting it in a boat. You have five minutes. Build away. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If you want to show off what you're building, you can put it up on. Um, uh, in your camera and we can we can share that out um, you know I think one of the, the challenges that students are facing right now is we've done this social distancing but really it's this physical distancing so how can we through an activity like this um, maintain that physical distance but limit the social distance bring students together to see what each other are doing and, and finding ways to share um, what they're making and what thinking they're going through in a fun activity like this. I see some people um, throwing some stuff up there. 
do, Emily, do you want to like, if you unshare, can will other people see? We got four minutes, a um, little less than four minutes going to, to build. I saw Adam throw some things up. He, well, it, is that like a packing material there? He's got some packing material. I happen to be in the room that has all of the things that have been delivered to my house over the past month and a half in it that have still been in boxes. So I found packaging supply. This and styrofoam, I think, might be coming handy. Yeah. Oh, that, that looks like a balloon. I like it. I like it. Yeah, and so I, I think students are going to have a lot of materials um, that they'll be able to use um, around the house that won't be uh, repurposing materials that shouldn't be destroyed, um, which is, you know, if, if my if my kids were doing this, they would go right for the actual PFDs and cut out pieces of those. Um, they'd need supervision. I see I, and that is that looks like more packing material or Ziploc bags, maybe? Ziploc bags, beautiful. Oh, uh, there's a glove. Many people are using gloves right now um, uh, to help with the uh, coronavirus and I saw a glove there. Excellent. So you have about uh, two minutes and 20 seconds left of the designing. Um, you may have your design. Now, th one thing you got to think about is how quickly can you get your life jacket on your can. Um, it can't be attached to the can when you start. Um, it's got to be, it's got to be on there. So imagine you're on a boat. Uh oh, the boat's going down. Time to go get the life jackets. You got to be able to do that quickly because you're going to end up in the water soon. You know, one of our design criteria, um, you know, one of them wasn't size, but I always think of size as uh, something that really holds back people from wearing personal flotation devices is they're sort of awkward and bulky. Um, I also think cost is another one. They're expensive. So if somebody's going out on, on a, just a, you know, one river trip, they're like, hey, should I really purchase or rent a personal flotation device? So I think that, that sort of access issue. So there's always other things. Don't think that you only have to utilize the design criteria we have. You can definitely put um, more design criteria in there and um, and give students more time to do this. We're sort of condensed on time in this professional development session, but you could always provide more time for students and, and other design criteria for them to think through as they're going through um, the design process. And um, spend more time on the, on the creation too. Come up with some really creative activities. The first time I saw this activity, I was at Eastern Oregon University and we we're doing this with a group of fourth and fifth graders. And um, I thought what was really great about it is they used like this air horn as the signal for when they had to put the personal flotation device on. So all the students had gone through this creation process and they didn't really tell the students when they were done. Um, and then they would like blow this air horn and all the students would run and take their um, uh, personal flotation device over to where the cans were and try to put it on there as fast as possible. It was kind of a, a fun way um, to do it. I'm not sure if there's a virtual option there, but something to think about when you're back in the classroom. Okay, so we are now five seconds away from, I'm sure, the point that you've waited all week for, the testing. Um, okay, so here we are. We are going to start the test. I'm going to run a stopwatch. At this point, you need to first attach your PFD to your can of soup. I will tell you when 20 seconds is up, we're on the honor system. If you make that, you're gonna get 30 points and then you're gonna get extra points for how long um, your PFD floats, up to a minute, right, Emily? Are we going only to a minute of floating? Okay, um, so I am getting my stopwatch ready prepare yourselves and begin. Okay, we're coming up on five seconds. Attach that PFD. Oh, looks like Emily, Adam, we got it. Um, two balloons. Okay, I'm looking here, we got a glove on. 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, now put the PFD into your water. Um, and see if it's floating. There, I see one that's already in there, um, and it looks like it's floating well. 
Um, we're at 38 seconds. So mine keeps floating like this. Like keeps floating like this. Here. And that's another thing to think about. What is the orientation which it's floating in? Uh, <laughs> if this is the face. Particular one. sizes and particular amounts of flotation in them um, for different weights of people. Like I wouldn't want to necessarily wear a child life jacket because it's not going to hold me up, but a child wouldn't want to wear an adult life jacket because it would be so buoyant that they're most likely their head would be in. Similar to Adam's poor can, um, we haven't really oriented where that can is um, as far as being able to breathe. So we're coming up on a minute and 20 seconds, um, seeing if it's all floating. We're going to end the experiment here. Three, two, one, stop. Okay. So how did people, how did, how did people do? Uh, you can either unmute yourself and uh, explain or you can write it in the chat. Okay, you are unmuted. Uh, oh, I think I'm, <laughs> we're unmuted. Sorry, yeah, we're sorry. playing, we're playing back and forth. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Yeah. Mine's floating. My head is barely above the water, but just enough. Excellent. As long as you can get that nose and mouth above the water, perfect. Yeah. I think if my bowl was bigger, if I was in an ocean or a lake, or then I'd definitely be above the water, but um, my bowl is kind of narrow at the top. So. I think you bring up a really great point too. Um, we're, we're in like really still water here. And a lot of times you're wearing PFDs if you're on a river and, the, and it's like going through rapids or if you're in the ocean and there's waves, there's definitely ways you could simulate that for students if they were doing it in a bathtub per se and they could move the water around and, and see what the effect of water crashing over it would do. Does it sink? Does it, does it stay on the can? Um, and that kind of gets back to our part of where we redesign and, and rethink and try to improve on these designs. Anybody else, go ahead if you want to share more or? Well, I, at first I thought about using tape, but then I realized the tape's going to get wet. It's going to dry. It's not going to stay. So I grabbed string and I tied it around the can. So it, the string definitely works, you know, obviously better because it's not going to unstick. So, yeah. yeah. And Excellent. I think, um, yeah. go ahead, Adam. If um, that that's also something to point out with with you sometimes if you say provide you with like here's an example list of items you could use feel free to throw out some that um, you know are like the red herring like they're gonna have to test it and use it and realize they shouldn't use it but it's so like tape is definitely a good one for this one I was thinking with my can um, since it just kind of was like this I might want to add like a distinctive face to it like a googly eyes or something so I could be more a cognizant about how it floats because I just saw packaging material that's going to float. This would be fine. But then if that was its face, it wouldn't be the best flotation device. So does it, would anybody else like to share their design, any successes, challenges, thoughts that they had for this first iteration? I'll, I'll go real quick. So I had Ziplocs that I had stapled, not in the bag, but on the edge. <laughs> To rubber bands and put those around there but the ziplocs themselves must have a hole somewhere because they got much smaller as well <laughs> did your can stay afloat or did it sink uh it floated but barely like yeah. joelle was saying like barely up there. barely above <laughs> yep exactly <laughs> Did anybody have any problems putting their life jacket on? Did everybody hit that 20 second? I'm here, it yeah. seems, some, seems like that was a good part. So, um, you know, we're gonna, the next step of this, and I think this is always the most, um, it, you know, I think this is a really fun part because students um, don't necessarily think about, okay, I've designed something, it worked, well, I'm done. And that's just not the way things happen, right? Engineers are always trying to improve that process. Even things that worked really well, we're trying to improve and make them better. And in this case, make life jackets that maybe have different criteria besides these basic criteria that we use. Um, or maybe get on faster. So instead of 20 seconds, we're going for 10 seconds or float longer. I see in here that uh, Emma's is still floating um, and you can, and a person could grab onto the fingers and orient their heads above the water. I like that. I mean, here's something that either the, the can could grab onto the fingers and hold them up, or maybe somebody could grab them out of the water. A lot of life jackets, you know, are designed to, to pull people out of the, 
out of the water. So these are other things to, to have students to think about is even if you have something that worked, even if you hit all the criteria, even if your can is still floating, how can you go back and improve that design? Are you entering in more criteria? Um, are you just trying to make it better? For example, orienting that head um, more up so it's, it's definitely out of the water, especially if that water gets turbulent. So any thoughts on ways that you might want to engage students in thinking about how to improve on their design. So I see on the chat, I use sink and float with my kids. We grab things around the classroom and then put them in water to see what we can use. Might be a good lead in. Yeah, I think that's great. Depending on um, what, what grade you're working with, uh, talking about density and buoyancy and how that plays into a part um, and even doing some measurements between the weight of the can um, and the negative airspace that you may have in some of the items that you're using, you can sort of predict the, the buoyant force versus the, the weight of the can um, would be a good extension on that. Having students build in a testing, uh, build in a testing of separate materials they could use, so pre-build testing phase. I think that's, I think that's great, especially as it's really hard to do this synchronously with students um, with different schedules and different technology available. Um, having students do something beforehand, share a picture, um, and sort of have that pre-building testing phase in there um, could be a good way to, to get this um, project moving. And then also having students be able to share what they're doing. Um, another thing that when I'm when I've seen this done in the classroom or doing other engineering activities in a classroom is that students are afraid to like look at their neighbor of what their neighbor's doing because they don't want to cheat. And I always try to say, it's not cheating. This is, this is collaboration. You want to, you, it's not like if you're designing a PFD, you don't buy every single PFD on the market and take a look at them and see how they work to try to improve on that design. It's okay to start where we're already at. And so utilizing their peers' ideas and trying to, to add on to them or improve on them is, is always a good thing too. I see another extension here, using PFDs on different cans, diet soda floats on its own, regular soda sinks. Very interesting, I did not know that. Um, you know, just why is that, why is that happening? I, I'm gonna, that's something I'm gonna test with my kids later today. Could give the students the option to compete um, with their family or siblings in a competition, then submit a family house, um, household design online. I think that's great. Um, a lot of times is how can, you know, this is a great, also what we call a family math and science night where we're trying to get family, families to participate in science together. Here's a great opportunity to do that and engage those um, older or younger siblings in the process um, to come up with some really cool ideas and designs within a family. Any other ideas before we move on? We still have a few um, more minutes. It, before we move on to uh, the next question. Other ideas. So one, one question I wanted um, to consider is, as you've been working now for a number of weeks on um, distance learning with students, what, um, how, how, can you, how can you see doing this with your students? What are some challenges they may face? What are some um, ways that you would get around those challenges of, of making this work with students at distance? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, we're a small group. Some of the things that I would have an issue with is the fact that I am mostly in a SPED department. Mm -hmm. And so some of the kids are, they'll take a little longer. They're sometimes a little shy. So of course it's not going to, you know, I, we go into Zoom meetings and some of them are laying on the couch with a blanket over their head. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some don't have involved parents. So, you know, to giving them time to, you know, we'll give you a couple days, gather up some stuff, and then maybe we can actually just all do the one step at a time. Let's talk about yours. Let's talk about this one and let's put it together. And so I think it's just a matter of maybe even spending that entire Zoom time just on that project. That can be your, your STEM, your science. That's, you know, and the kids love STEM, obviously. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great- Much better than reading, <laughs> even though that's what I teach. 
I, I think it's, I think it's a, that's a great idea is, is really thinking about, you know, we're, and the way this, uh, this activity has been designed is to do it in a, as a, in a compressed period of time, a, like a single class period and really compress down all the different stages of engineering design. But you, there's no reason why you couldn't spread this out over an entire week and right. have students really think about each of the different processes um, that they're going through as part of the engineering um, and design cycle. Um, I, I think that's I think that's great. Any other ideas or challenges? Getting enough bowls that are big enough for the floating challenge actually could maybe get a kid pool and do this outside where everyone does the challenge at the same time in the same pool could create waves turbulence in that way. Yeah, um, I have you know just thinking about like. A bathtub, maybe uh, a kitchen sink, um, yeah, kitty pool. I have this old kitty pool that's been sitting in my backyard, like that I move every time I have to mow the lawn. I'm like, here, that's a good use for it. Um, uh, something that you could use um, to to get more uh, family members uh, participating at the same time. It says I'm not going to do this during distance learning. I'm adding a unit next year to my marine science class called Ocean Survival. I'm going to add this unit. Excellent. You know, these, these activities here, we started this virtual professional development in order to provide teachers um, some professional development that they potentially could use as distance learning, but these are all activities that have been designed for use in the classroom. Um, so I encourage you, these resources are gonna be on our website. I encourage you to, to, to remember them, come back to them and utilize them when you do get back into the classroom as well. Okay, so I think, um, we are uh, going back in my time. I'll hand it back over to Emily. Perfect. Thanks, Jay. We'll get this PowerPoint back up. So we went over um, these questions um, Jay did. So what design aspects were key? What new materials would you try? Um, the constraints while teaching the lesson? And then um, have you had experience any, have you experienced any challenges um, in offering STEM lessons at a distance in the past? Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of extension activities um, and then have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so one of the ones that the RCRV um, project put together was a cost sheet to kind of make it a little bit more difficult. So with this, you would have a certain budget, so $100,000. Um, and then some material that they would have to purchase in order to use. Um, and this would definitely be for those students who either had these activities or these materials already, or are able to make adjustments to the material list as needed. So this is a Word document. Um, either you could change the materials or a parent or guardian could change the materials and then they would have to purchase those materials depending on it. Um, so for this, I would have to purchase my two um, rubber bands and two Ziploc bags, which I would return because there were holes in the bags, but anyway. Um, and then at the end of the trial, you could return anything um, that was still usable. And then there's another trial where you use the remainder of your budget to purchase new, um, new supplies. So that could be an extension or the entire activity, depending on whether you're leading it um, during your regular class time um, or this at distance learning. And then the other extension um, that we, Adam mentioned a little bit earlier, was, conne oops, sorry, was connecting uh, with RCRV. So Adam, you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, so um, going with the NSF goal of connecting people with uh, the folks doing the science, doing the engineering, um, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram, um, so if you like or follow us, you should be able to then, um, you know, create a post, kind of like, you know, your picture, you celebrating, um, saving the suit maybe. Um, and then you can post that and tag the RCRV program. If you want NSF, the National Science Foundation, to take note, uh, they could use hashtag NSF stories. Um, NSF is always looking for personal stories that kind of highlight people doing science. Um, and another one is hashtag OSU pre-college. Um, so if your students do it, they let us know they like it. Um, I, um, since I work also for the RCRV project, we are trying to be active on our social media. So hopefully, uh, you know, they'll see other folks because a number of people who follow the page are 
um, parents who also work for the RCRV project. So they're engineers, they're scientists, they're researchers. So it's a good way to build community um, and hopefully build some good uh, science identity affinity groups of like, hey, I did this thing and they saw me and these are people who really do that. So to promote that connection. Excellent, thanks. Um, one note really quickly um, is about our professional development units. So they're available for everyone here on the call today. They're, they will automatically be sent to everyone who registered through the ideal logic system. Um, if you did not register, but you would like a PDU, um, you only need to email precollege at oregonstate.edu and we'd be happy to get those to you. Um, and at the same time, if you did register and for some reason you did not receive a PDU, um, you're welcome to email us and we're happy to get those as well. So for this last um, several minutes, we might be ending a little bit early today. Um, we wanted to thank you for joining us definitely um, and bringing your life jacket inventions um, and then we're going to open it up to questions so if any of you have questions um, either about teaching or the activity we would be happy to answer them jay mentioned adding the idea of project budget is a great way to extend the lesson and introduce real world criteria that get students thinking about how to design for cost um, definitely a certain engineering aspect that goes into that that we didn't bring up in the beginning is the cost of materials. Yeah, and uh, a few other things that I would like to touch on is for the, um, the elementary standards for engineering, they usually start with creating a solution, creating and testing a solution. That's usually just one thing. And then it builds on with creating a solution that meets particular design criteria, that makes particular design criteria and solves a problem. So now we got to evaluate how it goes. But then at the other end, it goes to evaluating multiple solutions. So it kind of goes from one solution, providing it, evaluating multiple solutions, and then choosing the best solution of the possible solution. And that comes in at about high school level. So kind of thinking further down the line, how students, if they selected their life jacket, they made it, and maybe they had two or three other people do it and they saw it, just thinking about, you know, what kind of design would I want for my precious can of soup if I really wanted to save it? And so just having that discussion and thinking, you know, we all successfully completed this challenge differently. Um, how do we take what each person did to make the best soup survival can? Um, life jacket, I guess, is uh, something that is fun to talk about. It's also safe because we're just talking about soup. Um, a can of soup is pretty safe and fun <laughs> topic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'd like to add that we could use, might be out there for floating in the ocean, can we use recycled materials? Oh, excellent. So bringing in the aspect of um, where you're sourcing your material that you're making your life jacket from. Um, so if they're already out floating on the ocean, maybe we can use those recycled materials. Um, excellent. And, and I'll say too that um, thinking about this, this engineering and, and design project around um, building a PFD for a can of soup, it's the same process that goes through a lot of other um, engineering challenges and engineering challenges that you're probably already doing in your classroom um, and, and utilizing um, something that builds on each other. So the students are learning this process by doing one activity and then they're able to apply it as they do different activities throughout the year. On our website, we have a ton of engineering projects that utilize this sort of same process many of which that have extensions similar to the cost, um, cost estimates. And I think building on those skills, I mean, we're thinking about next generation science standards, it's all about um, you know, building skills uh, amongst young people that, that then they can apply as they go through elementary, middle and high school. And this is a great foundation um, for that, but can be utilized for those students who have been practicing this for many years. One thing I also just wanted to mention is um, there is uh, human-centered design. So if you do teach middle school or maybe upper elementary, um, human-centered design kind of builds on the design process with like interviewing someone. So maybe they were talking with someone who they needed to make a flotation device for a particular can from their pantry. So maybe it's a uh, can of jam that looks like a Welcher's bottle or a thing of syrup. Um, so you can throw in a couple of cogs when you kind of have someone else in it. And human-centered design expands on this process with thinking about a user. Um, so that was covered in a previous Perch PD session, and that asked students to design uh, protective masks and kind of goes through that. So if you think that's something your students would be interested in, go ahead and, and check out that previous PD. 
if you like. Also RCRV related one, there is one about careers that has a bunch of what I would call mini games that help students figure out their interests uh, relational to two places of work. And so for elementary students, that one would just help them be active and think about, hey, my interests in the world of work are skills and they could tell me what I would like to do. And that's also related to RCRB activities. So um, just two quick plugs of <laughs> previous things we've done that could be adapted to elementary students. And those activities are on the website that you used to register. Um, so the lesson plans, all of the supplemental activities, they're all on there. Um, so even if you didn't participate in the workshop, um, they are there for you. And I'll give a plug for next week. Um, next week, we're going to be diving into systems thinking. Um, we work with uh, um, industrial manufacturing engineering seniors every year as part of their senior capstone project. Um, for the past number of years, these students have been working on how to create educational materials to teach systems thinking. Systems thinking is embedded into um, the next generation science standards, but isn't commonly taught. Um, we're going to be having part of that team join us next week and talking about one of their activities. Um, that's a simulation activity um, of the tragedy of the commons. And yeah. it's, it's a fun activity, really um, pretty much no materials that you need to do and a way for students to be able to interact. So we'll have those team members uh, next week talking about systems thinking um, sort of in general and then go through that activity and then not next week but the week after that um, we're going to be doing bloom in a bottle working with uh, Stephen Gibanoni's lab here at Oregon State University um, who study ocean open ocean microbes they're going to be creating um, they've created an activity where you take a uh, water bottle um, just that you would buy uh, at a store and you find any sort of water, this could be out of a pond, a river, a lake, a puddle, and you put it in this bottle with a little bit of uh, fertilizer and watch an algae bloom happen. Um, and then they relate that back to all sorts of um, research and science that they're looking at um, from the carbon cycle to ocean dead zones to oil and gas um, deposits to climate change. So. Um, definitely don't miss that one two weeks from now. Excellent. Thanks, Jay. Um, so we will we'll give you another minute or so if you have questions or extension ideas or anything like that. Um, but if not, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you in a, um, a future PD session. Um, and we are always here with questions um, or ideas. So thanks for joining us. We'll stick around if you have questions, but other than that, have a wonderful day.